Yeah. Okay, let's start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ram. I work for Commvault Systems. Oh yeah, it's not audible. Can you see that? No. No, no, no. It's not there. It's not there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's better. All right, round two. Okay. Try again. Is it audible? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, I work for Commvault Systems, and uh, today I'll be talking about the integration of Glassdoorface into Commvault Data Platform. So I'll start with a very brief introduction about Commvault Data Platform because I don't think not many of the people will be familiar with what it does. So Commvault Data Platform, it provides data management for different kinds of application data. And when I say data management, we do protection, archival, and analytics of the managed data. And uh, when I say application data, application data could be anything like uh, different kinds of file systems. It could be databases, it could be email servers, or it could even be the virtual machines. So we manage all kinds of application data. <coughs> and. Uh, in, the, in our architecture, we have something called as media agent. It's a server. Okay, so it is actually these media agents which move their application data onto a backend store. So the backend store could be a cloud-based or a disk-based or a tape-based. And what I am talking today is mostly applies to these media agent nodes. And some of these nodes could be running a deduplication engine on them. And when deduplication is enabled, what happens is the application data, whatever is there, uh, it would be deduped and only the unique blocks would be written onto the backend store. And all the metadata about the data would be stored in the dedupe store. And finally, we have a coordinating server called the COM server, which provides the required <coughs> SLA. So that's briefly the architecture of what we do. And now, uh, what is the need of software-defined storage in such a data management product? So in a typical customer scenario, right, what happens is they have the application data which resides on a hardware-based storage. And as part of data management, we read that data and we either copy or we move that data completely onto some kind of another backend storage, which could also be a hardware-based storage. Now, uh, there are like two things to this data. This data is not static, the data which gets written onto the backend store. I mean, it grows at a reasonably fast rate because you would be maintaining, you know, uh, multiple versions of the application data at different points of time tagged with a timestamp. So it grows reasonably fast. And the second thing is this data is cold. And it is stored only for the key, only for you know uh, compliance or for DR scenarios or for business continuity purposes. So, given these two you know natures of the data, what our customers have started saying is all these days, right? There was some hardware storage and which provided some kind of interfaces like uh, NFS or you know SIFS uh, or any other native interface which the hardware provider gave which we accessed and we used to manage the data which used to get stored on top of that storage. Now what the customers are saying is you go ahead and you integrate with some kind of software defined storage. So you we not only have to manage the data which gets sit and written on top of the storage but we also have to manage the storage as such. So that's where we actually started integrating our data platform with some kind of software defined storage. And uh, when we started looking for a software defined storage, these are the requirements that we were looking for. And our most of our use case is like we need a software defined storage which is file system based, and we were looking for something which can scale horizontally. I mean, if we need some storage, we can just we should just be able to have, able to add some more nodes, and the store should expand just like that. And uh, most important thing is like this is cold data, so we wanted resiliency and. We, also, we didn't want it to waste the space. So that's why we were looking for something which supported erasure coding. And uh, it should be like easy to install, administer. And it's like, uh, it should be as software-defined storage, it's hardware agnostic. 
and the other things which we were looking is like each node right which each media agent node that I described earlier it would now become a converged data management so it should provide storage as well as it should be able to provide data management so be I mean, it's like we were looking for some kind of uh, software which is not too aggressive on hardware resources so that you know even our data management software could coexist along with that so given all these requirements when we tried out whatever were there we zeroed on to clusterfs and uh, this is in, in the common terminologies, right? We use the term storage pool to refer to all these entities, right? The entities could be like the cluster volume that gets created and the nodes, the media, the media agent nodes or the nodes on which the volume gets created, the underlying disks, which actually, you know, on which, out of which the bricks would be card and the volume would be created and the deduplication engine, which actually, you know, kind of provides the dedupe capabilities and the metadata store. So all of these entities are grouped together and we call it as a storage pool in our terminology. And uh, it's like because we were looking for erasure coding, we started uh, to use disperse volume. And what we are telling our customers is at this point of time, it's like it's a configurable parameter. And what we are telling them is to configure it to use either 3.1 or 6.2. That's what we are recommending to our customers at this point of time. So this would be a typical customer deployment and uh, like in which, you know, they might start with three nodes and and as I described earlier, right, we have a dedupe, we have a deduplication thing. So the nodes, the media agent, the nodes on which the deduplication would be running, we will call them as control nodes and the nodes would just provide the storage that we call them as data nodes. So in a typical deployment, the customer might start with three nodes okay and uh, it's like well or out of those two would be having the ssds and all which will be used for dedupe and the other would provide just the storage so as and when the requirement comes i mean it's like they can keep expanding the store by adding more of the nodes and we use the term block to refer to the collection of nodes which can be added at which should by which the store should be expanded so when the ssds will get filled at that point of time I mean the dedup I mean it's like deduplication cannot be done on the new data which gets stored. At that point of time, they can go ahead and add some more control nodes to it. And uh, we we have just said that you know uh, we have given a reference hardware reference architecture to our customers. So it's like uh, we are using uh, we are saying that a max of twelve nodes. 12 disks per server would be supported and uh, it's like the architecture, the hardware for control as well as data node would almost be the same. The only difference is that for the control nodes, we are saying that you have more NVMe flash so that that extra flash would be used for <coughs> storing the dedupe data. And uh, this is like, uh, so as I said earlier, right, we were looking for resiliency as well as minimizing the wastage of space. So this is how we would be laying out the cluster volume. So we'll be choosing a disk from each node and uh, it's like we'll, uh, we'll start with, you know, uh, we'll create a, we'll carve a volume out of that. So it's like in a typical scenario, right? If a customer starts with 12 disks, they'll have a cluster volume which consists of 12 sub volumes with each disk on a separate node. So if we do this way, even if one disk goes bad, right? I mean, it's like uh, the outage is very minimum. Only that particular subvolume is affected. And if you replace that disk, and if you try to, you know, uh, replace that brick, things would work. So, and if a full node is down, still then, I mean, it's like because of the resiliency factor, then we're able to do the man data management. And uh, <coughs> this, uh, how we integrate it into Glassdoffice is like we have, we have two options. So the first thing is like if the customer is very good at, uh, if they are hands on and they can do ClusterFS management installation and all by themselves. So what uh, they can do is like they can install the OS and they can install uh, ClusterFS on top of it. And what we tell the customer is like, you just mount the disks at a particular predefined location. So that mount path on each disk, we would be using it as brick we'll go ahead and we'll carve out the volume, we'll do everything for the customer. 
the only thing is like they have to just mount the disks at that particular location and the other way is like uh, we we have seen some customers wherein uh, which are non linux shops so for them right uh, learning understanding linux understanding setting up cluster itself like it's a too much of a steep learning curve just for those cases what we have said is like we'll give them a uh, i mean it's like we we'll, we we'll give them a utility which they can I mean, it's like uh, at the time of initial poc or anything they can just run that utility on a vm so once they run it on a vm we create an installable dvd for them so once they boot off with that dvd later on when they plug in the actual hardware appliance so the entire process of imaging that box creating cluster volumes and all it's all automated so we are making it much more easier for the customers to actually install cluster on their particular setups so have a demo Don't get offended looking at VMware. <laughs> 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 Can you full screen it, please? So it's like uh, the, the the use case will be like this: the customer he he creates a VM, and on the VM he installs like uh, cluster RPMs. He installs first he installs RHES or CentOS, whatever is needed. Then he'll install the cluster RPMs, and then he'll run the he'll install Commvault data platform, and then he'll run a utility. So once he runs the utilities, we'll create this DVD for them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as I said, right? We have two kinds. I mean, it's like. We have some disk for laying out the DDB and uh, for the dedupe, and we have some disk for laying out the cluster bricks. So now it's like uh, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll install the OS. It's not actually installation or anything. We are laying out things for the customer. So just fast forward. Yeah, so that's it. What's the typical application that the customers run on these? Sorry? Oh. What? <laughs> uh, no, actually, it is installed. The box is installed. The box is imaged and I've rebooted it. No, you, the screen was moving. Okay. What's the typical application that customers use? The, this is like the uh, uh, the as I said, right? The media agent node, whatever we said. So this is mostly just for the Commvault media agent thing. Okay. What uh, what like uh, okay. what industry is your <laughs> what uh, industry is your typical customer in? Is it like uh, like news and media? Is it uh, like uh, uh, actually Commvault has a lot of customers. Okay. So it kind of like like spans the gamut. So it's like like archival use cases, the core use case. Yeah. Okay. 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 And uh, it's like we have simplified the network management. So it's, if you just run, a, we just run and give a script. So once they run the script, it would set up all the networking and all for the customer. And, uh, Do you guys also support uh, this network? step? Uh, no, actually it is. We just, uh, whatever RHGS or whatever the customer has, okay. we'll just package binaries out of it. That's it. Yeah, so, so what I was trying to ask is, <laughs> no, we are just we, are, we just manage. That's it. Meaning, if, if something were to go wrong in the cluster, cluster, would you if the customer it? has a Red Hat support, <laughs> so that is the way by which the customer would go ahead. You just, you just de deploy. We just deploy. That's it. I mean, we are just making easier for the people to install Red Hat cluster. That's okay. it. So, so in other words, like, uh, so some customers may pick with a cluster as their storage platform. Others may pick like a proprietary storage solution. Is that, that's kind of the yeah. Uh, it's proprietary. I mean, for the hardware thing, we already have support for a lot of hardware. So okay. it's, it has been there. Software-defined storage is something new, mm -hmm. which is just coming up, okay. and uh, probably right for the archival use cases, this would be like a 
best fit. Okay. And uh, what other kind of storage, uh, software client storage uh, solutions that you consider? So like. Uh, for us, right, uh, as I said, right, mostly we, we need something which is like a file system kind of interface. Oh, yeah. that, that's the reason why we zeroed on to cluster. So kind of rounded it down pretty quick. Yeah, Because <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Swift, too. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, let me pause a little bit. So what happened <laughs> here is like there are like three boxes. though. So we have already imaged two boxes before this. And this is the third box. So what happens now is now we are yeah so Yeah, so there was no cluster volume present on the earlier two boxes, <coughs> and now we are trying to image this. So now what we'll do is like we'll go ahead and we register whatever box has been created just now with our com server. We just want to reduce that initial learning curve so mm -hmm. people can just go ahead and deploy it. Yeah. They don't want to be experts in hard and storage. Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys do if they don't already have the subscription from Red Hat? Uh, actually, right, if it is like if it is installed, we pick it up from there. So if the customer doesn't have any support or anything, then they'll not get the support. Right? If it yeah. is, if they if they install the upstream version, uh -huh. if they install the upstream version, then it's like if anything goes wrong, they have to probably get to you guys through the <coughs> help list. We we have nothing to do with the support. What what we do is like only we are making it easy for them. Let us know when that happens. Then. Yeah. <laughs> what's, what's the recommended version of Luster? You guys? Uh, uh, yeah. Actually, we we are saying about three dot seven dot eleven. I think because there was some problem with Azure coding before that. Yeah. Uh, Xavier pointed out saying. Uh, it's a uh, actually, right. Uh, we had a problem in which uh, there were like partial reads which were happening, and because of which we were getting uh, XTR checksum errors. Then you said that you kind of fixed that issue in 3.7.11, I guess. Yeah, but that was like so yeah, so the volume got created now. So no, I'm saying I'm saying that might be easier. Another the another the. Okay, very nice. Because you guys put another. And uh, it's like if you want to expand or if you want to add more disks. <coughs> so we just give them a utility. And if they run, we go ahead and we detect what are all the new disks which are there. And uh, they can ju we'll just add them to the, oh, oh, add them as new bricks. Each disk is like 64 GB, is it? It's a, a small Star test VM. That's yeah. it. So what happens is, uh, in the back end, uh, we have some uh, space checker thread, which keeps checking for newly added disks or bricks. And uh, it goes ahead and it orchestrates the expansion of the volume. 
So, do you? So, yeah, this is what we went through just now. Yeah, I mean, if they want to add more number of nodes, they can just add the storage. And uh, if it is, if they want to add more number of nodes, they can simply follow one of the above procedures. They can just add them, and uh, we'll kind of orchestrate the expansion of the volume. It's all taken care of. It's all automatic. Okay. So, and for adding more number of disks, it's like you can just run the utility. Yeah. It's your um, display settings. Nearly a time, so. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and uh, we have added some health checks. So probably what we do is like we periodically monitor the status of the each uh, node in the storage pool. We also check the status of the XFS file system, whether the file system is intact. We go out and we check the status of the underlying block device, uh, and it's like whether all the reads and write, all the reads are going through. And uh, we also monitor the smart parameters which the hard disk reports. And if any of the smart parameters say that you know the disk is going bad, we kind of we have an event mechanism in our product through which we trigger that you know things are going bad. Now it's time to actually replace your disk. So yeah, and uh, some of the things that we for which you know we might want to contribute is probably at this point of time we don't have the support for hole punch last slide. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point of time, there is no support for the file system hole punching. So that we probably that is needed. <coughs> yeah, I think somebody posted it. We just need to review it. It will be done. Okay, okay. for the erasure code. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, the other thing is like DR tools. If something has really gone bad and you just have the disks yeah, yeah, yeah. for the erasure yeah. code to reconstruct back it. the data, I think there are no DR tools. Yeah. We will, we will. Just make another EC volume and copy the files over the <laughs> 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 the only way I know to do it. Right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.